I set a captured dogman free. Dear Scary Stories NYC, The email address I am sending this to you from was created by me 10 minutes ago on a computer in a public library. I gave false ID to use this machine. I'm leaving the state as soon as I send this email and I never plan on returning here again. I'm on the run from very powerful people because a number of years back, I set a captured dogman free. When I peered into its crazy looking eyes, I saw a living soul looking back at me. I know some people think that dogman is supernatural or paranormal, and for all I know, some of them actually are. This one was a real animal though. It smelled like an animal, it ate, it relieved itself, it was a real living thing, a biological creature. It had a head, like a primitive version of a wolf from caveman times or something, but it had the body of a human athlete. Well, that's not entirely correct as it had a tail and had legs like the hind legs of a quadrupedal beast. It had the posture of a human though, and the presence of one as well. It stood and looked at you the way a man would. It was unnerving to lose a staring match with the creature. This dog-headed, fur-covered man seemed to possess a kind of intelligence. It was different from human intelligence, yet also far superior to an ordinary canine. If it took these people five years to capture just this one, how many of them could be left? What if this was the last dogman ever, and we were holding him prisoner? What if dissecting him, as the scientists would certainly do, would mean the end of his species? Please feel free to use what you like from this letter, but don't bother writing me back, as I never plan on checking this email again. It wouldn't be safe for me to do so. I don't want to give them a chance to track me down, and by them... I mean my former benefactors. You see, I got involved with a group of very powerful men, kind of by accident. I was working a job at a major corporation and was taken under the wing by a particularly high-powered executive. As I was not even an Ivy League graduate, this was a surprise to both me and pretty much everyone else in the company. It meant I'd have a chance at moving up in the hierarchy one day, it meant a little more money, and it meant a lot more work. I always felt welcomed and encouraged at my job, and I viewed this company and its executives as benign and kind people doing good in the world. When I was invited into a secret side project of some of these key executives, I was only too happy to volunteer my services. It turned out that the project involved hunting an exotic animal. I was surprised to learn that these powerful men believed that a kind of werewolf existed in the woods of America, and they called it a dogman. I had seen a TV show about heavy-set guys with long beards trying to capture a real werewolf, and it looked so ridiculous to me at the time that I assumed dogman and everything of that nature was a load of crapola, if you know what I'm saying. These guys I was working for, though, they were not some old men with long beards. When I got to their hidden outpost in a location in the Midwest that would surprise you, I was more than a little stunned at the size of the facility and the number of personnel. They had the capability of running multiple SWAT missions simultaneously, I was told. I remember asking why they would need to run multiple SWAT missions simultaneously, and I got the evil eye from my boss. I saw that this was not a weekend golf game and I was not supposed to be joking around. I had stumbled into some very serious guys, playing some very serious games with very serious stakes. They had drones operating, sending in video information from multiple locations in our target area. I personally had wanted to shoot drone footage in one of those areas, so I knew it was not allowed there. Eventually, I learned that the types of drones they were using were so much smaller than the commercially available ones and were in fact designed to look like birds and large insects. In that way, 
they were able to fly drones in areas where it was illegal, yet never get caught or even noticed. We had an area in the facility filled with big cages, large enough to hold an elephant. They were all empty. At points when my boss indicated it was safe to talk, I asked him a bunch of questions like, how long had they been doing this? How many dogmen had they captured so far? What do they do with them when they capture them? Why doesn't the public know about any of this? It was asking those questions that brought me fully into their world and really made me an accomplice. The fact that I didn't back out of all of this after he answered those questions showed that I was complicit in whatever happened next. So what did he in fact answer? What was I told? They had already been doing all of this for over five years by that point. They had never captured one single dogman. The public didn't know and the government didn't officially know either because this was a private operation. That having been said, these guys were well connected and had a lot of friends in high positions inside multiple organizations and institutions in both the state and federal government. Nevertheless, my boss hinted that even if they eventually succeeded in capturing a dogman, it would still be kept hush-hush. The creature would essentially be dissected to learn everything about what dogmen actually are, and the information would be held by the company. They would trademark its DNA if they could. They would figure out how to breed more of them using artificial means. My boss and his partners did not think that information was for the public to know. Instead, they viewed every person outside the company as part of their competition, and they viewed all information they possessed as industry trade secrets. If people knew they had the ability to breed dogmen, then they couldn't use that ability secretly or for nefarious reasons anymore, could they? So these men who I had looked up to operated by an entirely different set of moral boundaries than I was used to. I found their behavior repugnant and off-putting. I was in too deep to get away though, and so I did my best to seem enthusiastic and interested in the subject of dogman in the way that they were. They had shown me no actual evidence proving the existence of these werewolves anyway, so I figured I was worrying over nothing. They couldn't torture and dissect a dogman if dogman didn't really exist. And if a huge operation like this was unable to capture even one dogman in five years, then I was thinking maybe they just aren't really there. On the day when they finally captured and subdued an actual dogman though, I knew I had reached a turning point in my life. I was either going to be part of this abuse of a rare animal, or I was going to ruin my relationship with my employers. I thought about trying to retire from the program, but I knew that would make working my ordinary job impossible. I had to do something, but I had not yet decided what that would actually be. I described before how looking into the creature's eyes was unnerving. I don't want to make it seem like I had access to stand around staring at him all day. There were occasions on that first day when I could look at him for periods of time, you know, 10 seconds, 30 seconds a minute, that sort of thing. I have to say that I understand why people feel such deep fear when coming across these beasts in the wild. They look flat out nightmarish, or at least this one did. We were also keeping it in a fairly cold chamber, so you'd see his breath evaporating in front of him. It gave him a scarier appearance somehow, with the smoke emanating from his mouth and nostrils. Most dogs, even dangerous ones, will pant and drool and act laid back most of the time. This creature glared and glowered out of the cage at all of us. Granted, it was in captivity and had reason to be annoyed with all of us humans, but animals don't usually stay angry around the clock. Only evil villains in the comics can pull that off, and even some of them need time off from being scary. This dogman seemed to have been built to be scary, 
designed to be scary. I expected that in the wild, he probably won most fights without lifting a finger just by his intimidation power. I remember viewing him while he was caged from a second story window looking down at him and I still felt unsafe and I still felt too close to him. In the morning, both the doctors and the video photography crew would arrive to document the creature's existence in multiple ways. It would be too late if I waited till the morning of the second day. I had to make my move that first night. That was why I volunteered to do security on that first overnight. My bosses trusted me, which reveals that there is a human side to them after all. I abused that trust, and that's why I'm now on the run. I had three guys assigned to assist me as security was obviously a top priority. We all talked excitedly about the creature for the first half hour, then quickly settled into a sleepy boredom. We were only halfway through the shift when I told the guys nothing was going to happen, so they might as well go on home. Nobody was going to break into that facility, and I could babysit the monster by myself just fine. Eventually, they all took my advice and went home early, leaving me with only about an hour before the next shift was going to arrive, along with the doctors and photographers. I went down to the level that the dogman was locked up in, and I walked past him to open up the garage door in the loading area. This way, if the dogman did get out of the cage, he would be able to escape back to the woods. Now, all I had to do was open the cage itself. Of course, that would be far too dangerous to do while on this level. I walked over to the dogman in his prison to switch the electronic door system controls up to the second level. Now, I was set to betray the men who had trusted me and allow the animal they had spent five years and untold millions to capture to walk right out of their high security facility. I knew this would be my last chance to see the dogman with my own eyes, so I have to admit, I did stand there for a while and just stare. In all of that day, I had not yet seen the creature sit down, and I had no idea what position it slept in either. I never saw it down on all fours, I only saw it standing. Do they stand up to intimidate the rest of us with their height? Or is the intimidation just a side effect? I was told the height they called him at back then, but I forget the exact number. It was between 7 and 8 feet, but it seemed to grow wider as it grew taller, so it felt bigger than that. I remember how even when I stood 10 feet back, it felt as though I had to look up to see his eyes. He had a kind of mane of dark hair around the back of his neck and the top of his shoulders, making those massive, muscular, man-like shoulders seem even larger than they actually were. His chest also seemed far wider than any human chest, yet far more human-looking than canine. I've read and listened to a lot about the Dogman since this all went down, and I noticed the discussion about whether Dogman has paws or hands. I can only answer for the one I had to deal with, but I'm going to hedge my answer anyway. To me, the paws looked like paws, giant, huge, oversized, clawed paws, the same as any cat or dog would have, only much, much bigger. The thing is, the paws were just so large that they may as well have been hands. He could wrap the finger parts of those paws around the bars of his cage, then wrap the dew claw around the other side like a thumb, so that it looked basically the same as a creature with furry hands holding onto the bars of his prison. I hope that made sense because I'm uncertain if I'm describing it well enough. Did it have hands? Well, yes and no. The head reminded me of a wolf, but as I said before, a very evil-seeming kind of prehistoric wolf. Its eyes always looked furious and it never seemed to stop baring its oversized teeth at the room. It never relaxed. It never panted with its tongue hanging out. We had it in a brightly lit room, so I did not see the famous eye shine. I can only imagine looking up to see one of those beasts in the darkness with those eyes shining back at you. 
I think I would faint on the spot. He made me feel terrified even while he was locked up in that cage. In fact, this creature, who was doing absolutely nothing but standing there and breathing, caused my body to react like I was in great physical danger. I mean, I noticed my hands were shaking. Granted, the room was cold, but it wasn't that kind of a shiver, because I was also sweating unnaturally. I felt nauseous. I felt dizzy. I was that frightened while that walking, hairy, dark-colored nightmare glared at me. Even when I turned to leave the room, I felt goosebumps in my back as I knew he was watching me exit. I could have taken the elevator up, but I wanted to walk up the stairs to give myself some time to think. Was I really going to go through with this? I mean, yes, it was wrong that this man-like beast was going to be ripped apart by the scientists. And yes, it was horrible that this company might acquire the ability to create an army of dogmen. These things were and are wrong on so many levels. On the other hand, I witnessed how terrifying that man-eater is. I've been close to caged lions and tigers before, but I never felt the kind of savage emergency fear that I felt when the dogman was there. Did I have the right to release something that absolutely horrible back into the wild? If that dogman later killed someone, wouldn't I be partially responsible? Was this really the right thing to do? Or would my actions be even worse than the actions of my employers? For better or worse, I decided to go through with it. I marched into the second story control room and I unlocked the electric door of the cage. Then I watched as the dogman tentatively reached out to the door, apparently expecting it to be electrified. That gave me shudders since it demonstrated that they must have already attacked him using taser-like weapons. When the dogman succeeded in opening the cage door wider and he realized he could escape, he did so with such suddenness, power, and speed that I almost fell over. I had no idea that something that large could move that fast. It was out that garage door and gone in a second, and I had to decide what I was going to do next. I thought about erasing the video of the event, but they would know it was me either way. Nobody else could have done what I did. I thought about trying to explain why I did this to any of my bosses, but I knew that nothing good would come out of that. I grabbed some printer paper, wrote, I resign on it, signed my name, and left the building. When I got home, I saw strange men in the hallway on my floor, and I backed away before they saw me. They had my apartment door open, and they were walking in and out carrying things. These were not the police, and these were not burglars. I had already been found out, and the company reacted more aggressively than I had expected. I soon learned that they were quite interested in terminating my existence, and I began an entirely new life on the run. I can't go into witness relocation because my former bosses have too many friends at the federal level. I'm sure someone would sneak out the info to them about where I had been moved to and what my new identity was. I have made some new friends in various places, and I find myself living the David Banner life from the old Incredible Hulk TV series. I do a lot of manual labor, and I try to hide any evidence that my background is anything but working class. I stay on the move, and I keep a low profile. I won't say that I regret letting the dogman go free, but... I do regret getting involved in my boss's private projects in the first place. I wish I had never found out about any of this. I don't have the cojones to rat them out, so I'm really not a danger to them. I wish they could just forget about me. I'll never lead a normal life again because... I set a captured dogman free. The one who laughs last laughs the best. You know, I don't mean that in jest. 
We all gonna have a blast. Our EP is the one who laughs the last. Please join me in welcoming our newest channel member, the one who laughs last, without whom this episode would have been impossible. In return for their generous kindness, the one who laughs last gets to see our weekly Sunday uncensored dogman stories far too wild to run on this channel. And you can too. Just join our PayPal subscribers club at peterbernard.com or else do what the one who laughs last did and click that shiny jolly join button under this or any of our videos. And now, here's TV spokes puppy Henry Lee Dogman to fill in the rest of the deets. Hank? Thanks for watching till the end. If you liked what you saw, please consider clicking like on the video or sharing it with your friends and family that you think might also be interested. If you would like to see more of our work, please consider subscribing and hitting that bell icon next to the subscribe button so that YouTube will alert you when we put out a new video. To become a channel member and gain access to our special perks, you can click that join link under each of our videos. Another option is to join our PayPal subscribers club at peterbernard.com. You can join for as little as 99 cents on YouTube or a buck fifty at peterbernard.com and that gains you access to our weekly secret uncensored episodes. If you'd like to see our 21 hours of archives of uncensored dogman stories, then please join at the $3 level or above. To get to watch our shows in advance of the public, please join at our $10 level. That gets you all the perks. If you join our channel memberships, you need to check our community page here on YouTube in order to get the links to the secret videos and other perks. If you're in the PayPal Subscribers Club, Peter will email you all the news and links himself. Once joining the PayPal Club, which is Peter's homemade club, please give him a chance to see that you've joined and to compose you a personal welcome email, as none of that is automated. But whichever you join, we'll name you an executive producer for the next available episode. Do you have a scary experience that you'd like to share with us? You can email us at scarystoriesnyc at gmail.com or call our Scary Stories voicemail hotline at 804 le scary That's 804-537-2279. It's a Google voicemail box, so that means it keeps cutting off after every three minutes. If your story is longer than that, Please keep calling back and we can piece it together on our end. Good night and have a scary tomorrow. Come back for more scary stories.